So this, this patent I got for a client years ago. It was issued in, in 1999. It's for an eyeglass locator system. And, um, uh, you know, as I described before, there's, um, there's drawings that show it's basically a pair of eyeglasses and a transmitter. You hit a button on the, the transmitter on that keychain, and it, it basically lights up and makes a sound from your eyeglasses so that you could find the eyeglass, right? Um, and um, they had in mind putting the, um, uh, um, that receiver inside the, the earpieces of the eyeglass. And so essentially, that's what the patent application was about. And now if we look down to the claims, let me show you how this works. So at the very end of every patent, it says what is claimed is, um, and, and by the way, do me a favor, if you can see the arrow that I'm moving on the screen, just in the chat, um, like just say yes. I just wanna make sure you can see that I'm using this as a pointer here. Um, and uh, um, so then that's clear. But anyway, right where I am right now at the bottom of that page, it says what is claimed is, um, and then claim number one, it says an eyeglass locator system for locating a pair of eyeglasses, having a frame, and having a pair of earpieces extending rearward from the frame comprising. So this here is a complete claim. This is actually a very broad claim, which is unusual. Broad means it covers a lot. Um, because the way the claims work is that in order for something to infringe this claim, it needs to have all of the elements present in this claim. In other words, meet the full description. So when it comes to a claim like this, shorter is better. And this is what's called an independent claim because it stands by itself. It starts with an uh, or a, so an eyeglass locator system. This is the complete description of what would infringe. So the independent claim, and then so, and it has two elements here. Um, it says, um, a transmitter for producing a radio frequency signal. So basically that's the thing that signals, that sends a signal out, that thing on the, that would be on the keychain, but it doesn't say the keychain there. Um, and a receiver portion located at the eyeglasses for producing an audible, in other words, sound and visual alert in response to the radio frequency signal to allow the eyeglasses to be located. So very, very simple is if you make um, an eyeglass locator system, which is basically a pair of eyeglasses that have a frame and the earpieces, um, and it has a transmitter, and then um, a receiver located in the eyeglasses that produces an audible visual alert, then that would infringe this patent. Simple as that. You know, notice the transmitter. It doesn't require that it's in any particular form or that it's, um, you know, like located in a, a keychain or that it's, um, uh, you know, or that it's got a push button or anything like that. There's no real limitations on this. So this is really general. This was a very strong patent because it covered a whole new concept right here. Um, and so that claim one is stronger than probably 95% of the patents out there. Like, th like this one claim by itself, um, if someone was infringing this, they would be infringing the patent. But for various reasons, we add additional claims, which then provide a, a fallback, which then provide um, a hedging strategy. So here, if you look down here, claim two, it says the eyeglass locator system as recited in claim one, wherein the receiver portion is located at the earpieces. Okay, cool. So then I added an additional limitation to it in claim two. This, this claim refers to claim one. It depends on claim one. They call it a dependent claim. So basically, um, you know, you can't, someone can't infringe your patent. Uh, like if they're infringing claim two, then they're already including infringing claim one because claim one has less limitations. Claim one requires less. So this is like adding an additional requirement for infringement. Um, and then claim three is adding an additional requirement again. Claim three, the eyeglass located system as recited in claim two, wherein the earpieces each have a distal end, that means like the far end, and wherein the receiver portion is encapsulated in at least one of the earpieces at the distal end. So now we're specifically limiting it to being at the end. 
um, at the end of the earpiece. So this is adding an additional limitation. So now why are we hedging like this? Two reasons. Um, number one, if this was in, your pat in the patent application and the examiner looked at claim one and said, you know, I have other examples of, um, of eyeglasses that have um, transmitters, but usually the transmitter is in the eyeglass case. And we say, oh, wait, but our claim two says, um, da, 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 no, it's not claim two. I said that wrong. Um, da, 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 um, okay, well, say they, they say that the, the, um, um, that the, um, the, trans, that the receiver um, is in the, um, um, in the frame itself where, where the lenses are. Um, and so the examiner is saying, hey, we have another example of that. So then now we turn to our claim two. And our claim two um, requires that the receiver is in the earpieces. Okay, so then now we might take this text out of claim two, put it into one slightly bigger claim one. And now with that additional limitation, we argue to the patent examiner, hey, this should be patentable because no one has done it this way. And now this is part of our, our main independent definition of the invention. Um, and then the examiner might approve it. So that's one scenario, what we're hedging for. Um, the other scenario is for um, litigation. So when you find someone who is infringing your patent, they, um, um, you know, and, and imagine you sue them, one of the defenses to patent infringement is that the patent's invalid. And they say, well, you know, we may be infringing what's written there, but that patent shouldn't have been granted because that's just too broad. Um, there are other examples that go way back of that same exact thing. So if the patent office examiner had that in front of him or her, if, if they knew about that, they would never have granted this patent. So they say they have an example that shows the basic eyeglass locator as in claim one. So then we say, um, well, then what we hope for is that that person is also infringing claim two. In other words, they're doing it um, they're putting their receiver in the earpieces like claim two requires. And if that's the case, um, then, um, you know, and they're infringing claim two and claim two is not considered invalid, then we still have an infringement case. So like in lit again, in litigation, um, some of the claims might get struck down as being too broad. Um, and then hopefully they're still infringing some of the later claims. And that's why we do this as a trait. And so just to further answer your questions about how many, um, I'd like each additional claim to add an incremental step that itself might be, um, you know, might be worthy of a patent. So, um, you know, so here I zoomed in a little bit, you know, in claim two, we added the fact that it's in the earpieces. Um, in claim three, we added the fact that it's at the distal end of the earpieces. That might be significant. Um, and in claim four, we added that the transmitter is in a keychain. So, you know, that again, like if there's other systems where it was nothing like this, then the keychain might itself be considered to be um, uh, enough of a distinction to make it um, patentable. But now, is this a distinction that your competitors care about? So are they going to want to copy yours and make it in a keychain? Um, if so, then this is a good claim. But what happens often in a lot of patents is that you don't have a, a, a very general claim one like this that, um, that covers a whole lot of ground. And then there's very little way for a competitor to get around this. You know, once you start getting in the weeds and, and if the patent's broadest claim is way limited to some of these further details down there, um, you know, in terms of, um, 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 you know, how the, the, um, the, tr the receiver is located in a sleeve um, that extends over the earpieces, for example, as in claim five here, you're giving the competitors ways around the patent. You're giving them ways to, to say, well, you know, we don't need to do that. We don't need to put it in a sleeve around uh, that extends around the distal end of the earpieces. We could do it this way. So um, kind of the more in the weeds that the patent gets, the more likely it is that someone could get around it. And so uh, that's why, what, like what I said before, is that having one good claim 
is way more valuable than having a patent that has 40 narrow claims. Okay. Um, and just one other thing I want to show you while we're here, this is another type of claim here. Um, claim seven. Um, this is for, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit more. Uh, a little too much. Um, this one says an eyeglass locator method. Um, so the previous one is what we call an apparatus claim, an eyeglass locator system, you know, for locating eyeglasses. So this is describing the physical product itself. Um, but then the method, claim seven, it's just a series of steps. Um, and this could be very valuable too, because if you look at this method claim, this is even broader. This is barely limiting um, to how um, the, the product is physically manifested. This is just about, um, about, um, about a method itself. And so if someone else uh, makes a product that follows these steps, they would also be infringing. So let's take a look, look at this together. This is actually pretty amazing. So there's an eyeglass located method for locating a pair of eyeglasses, having a receiver portion mounted at said eyeglasses and a transmitter um, comprising the steps of. So basically it's just requiring initially as far as to give it context here that it's a pair of eyeglasses that have a receiver you know, at the eyeglasses. That can mean inside of, on top of anything, just at. Um, and it has the following steps. Go to this column here. Um, first, producing a radio frequency signal from the transmitter. Okay, you know, just about anything that's going to send a signal, it's going to produce it signal from the transmitter. The second step is receiving the radio frequency signal at the receiver. Okay, again, pretty standard. And then producing an audible and visual alert from the receiver portion at the eyeglasses. That's pretty broad. Now, like just looking at this and trying to like um, Monday morning quarterback this, if I was a competitive patent attorney, like with a competitive represented a, a competitor, um, I would look at this and say, well, you know, if you're going to use an RF signal, which means like a radio signal, then there's very little way around these two steps. I mean, the only thing you could do is if it was like infrared, which is like light, but the problem with light um, is that it doesn't go through objects. So if the eyeglasses were hiding under your blanket, then the signal would never get to it. So it's pretty much gotta be a radio frequency signal. It's gotta be just a, a regular radio signal. And so there's no way around these. And then this final step, producing an audible and visual alert. Um, so again, um, that's pretty good. The only thing here that might, you might be able to do to get around it is that it's, just an audible alert. So it just beeps. And I don't remember, but I imagine before this patent, maybe there was something that, that beeped. And so we couldn't get something that ridiculously broad. We had to say audible and visual. So it beeps and it blinks, right? So if someone wants to make um, an eyeglass locator system that beeps and blinks, they're going to be infringing this. Um, so there's very little way, almost no way around this. So this was a very valuable method claim right here, because that in itself is enough to really stop um, people from coming even close to it. Um, and uh, so I, I hope that that fully answers the, the question that you're asking about, um, you know, about how to um, um, determine like a reasonable number of claims and what approach you should take with claiming um, and, and what, um, what ought to go in the claims in terms of what features and what, um, what elements. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's the tutorial for today. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, we do this every Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific. You can click the link in the post to be invited to join us on the Zoom so you could then ask me anything about patents and trademarks. Mm -hmm.